Well, let me ask you guys, have you learned some stuff about apologetics over these last 15, 16 weeks? I'll tell you what, the guys that have have stepped up and taught, man, they have done a fantastic job, and I am proud of each and every one of them. Andy, Tommy, Keith, uh, Van, all those guys just knocked it out of the park, and I am proud of them. They, man, they did great. They did great. Rick. Brock. I forgot Brock. Yeah, Brock, you did a good job too. <laughs> oh, man. All right, so tonight, um, going a little off of course because this would be my last Wednesday night with you guys. Uh, if you hadn't heard the news, uh, the vote went well. They didn't tell me to take a hike uh, down in San Antonio. It was a 99% yes vote. Uh, two no's, I'll win them later. Which two? <laughs> oh, a quick two, yes. Uh, yeah, I can win them quick, maybe, maybe. Uh, but it, it's, it's bittersweet because I'm, I've never been so torn up because of the relationships that we've made here over the last eight years really impacted my life. This has been life-changing for he, me here for the last eight years but I'm also confident 100% without a shadow of a doubt that God is calling us. So it's never easy to walk through those doors, but you know it's the right thing to do and it makes it tough. So tonight, what I wanted to do was kind of uh, do what, um, maybe a, an overview of, of the things that I wish that you had gotten from me. If you've received anything from these Wednesday night teachings all the way back when we were doing walk through the Bible. And, and how many of you here went through the whole thing with me? A plus, A plus tonight. Yeah, went through the whole thing. We went through walk through the Bible together and, and we've done several other studies, book studies since then. And this is what I hope that you got from tonight. I wanna take an overview of the word of God and really talk about what it is and what it does for us. And it's really only two points tonight uh, for what I want to get across, but I'm pretty sure it's gonna take me the entire time. So just buckle up and comb your hair. We'll get there in just a minute. I was reading about um, the modern pencil, the number two pencil, yellow graphite pencil with an eraser on the end. You know what I'm talking about, right? It dates back to the 1500s, a simple writing instrument. The design is a piece of wood with a graphite rod that goes through the center, is topped with a rubber synthetic eraser. Simple, easy, right? But have you ever stopped to think about what goes into the making of that pencil? Every pencil, 10 cents at the most, right, starts with someone planting cedar trees. That's, this is where they come from. They're made of wood. Someone else mining graphite, a chemist in a lab working out the formula for the synthetic rubber. The trees grow, they're cut down, they're loaded on a truck, they're hauled to a sawmill. The cedars are cut into blocks that are then sliced into pieces half the width of a pencil. After the graphite's removed from the earth, it is ground down to powder. It is then mixed with clay. Water is added and the mixture is then shaped into this long spaghetti-like string and is to be dried in a kiln, dipped in wax, cut to the right size. And then finally, these graphite rods are inserted into the cedar plank. And then the other half is glued on top of that plank. And then there is topped off with a piece of tin and then a rubber eraser on the end. And you get all that for 10 cents. That's amazing, isn't it? All that goes into making a pencil, something so simple. You would think that all the trouble that it takes, it would cost more money. It would be more valuable to us. But all of that, the planting of the trees, the mining of the graphite, the making of the synthetic rubber, and kids use it to play pencil break. I mean, honestly, so much goes into it. And when I look at the Bible, 
I kind of feel the same way. Look how much has gone into the making of the word of God. 35 authors, 1,500 years, every cross section of humanity. It doesn't come close to adding up to the value that people give the word of God today. It's not valued. It's like that 10 cent piece of wood that we call a pencil. But there's so much that goes into it that makes it so valuable and yet it's just overlooked so many times by so many. But for those of us who understand the value, it's because the word of God is precious, isn't it? The word of God is precious. It's purer than gold, it says about itself, sweeter than honey. It renews life and makes the inexperienced wise. It's living and it's able to cut to the bone. It's, it's able to judge thoughts and intents of the heart. And don't forget the fact that it endures forever. This is the word of God, the word of God. And if you grew up in church, you're probably familiar with all of the stories of the Bible, right? The well-known stories, Noah and his floating zoo. Everybody loved that story as a kid. Why do kids love that story? I guess, is it the animals? And the pictures that people paint, all the elephants are smiling and there's giraffes. I don't think anybody was smiling on that boat. They were on that boat for a year. No one was happy that there was only one window in that boat. Nobody. Whew. Or maybe you've felt kind of like David facing down giants. I love that story. Maybe you, you, you've even read the story of Daniel in the lion's den and thought about how scary that must have been to be poor Daniel down in that den with hungry lions. And that's just the Old Testament. Think about the New Testament, the Gospels, Jesus walking on water, healing the sick, rising up the lame and they're walking again. I mean, these stories are fantastic, these miracles. And, and perhaps they're, they're not just intended to amaze us. The whole point of the scripture is to point us to the one. The whole point of the Old Testament, that giant picture book, so to speak, that is hidden New Testament principles. And then the New Testament principles that reveals these Old Testament saints. It all points to the one, Jesus Christ. This is what the Bible is all about. If you didn't grow up in church and you're not familiar with the Bible, you may assume that it's this well-meaning series of morality tales or an anthology of philosophical musings or, or, or an archaic rule book that needs to be locked into a, a room somewhere. Or maybe for you, the Bible is nothing but what you find in a hotel room in the drawer. But can I tell you, it is much, much more than that that it is the word of God and the word of God is living. And this word of God is uh, not just a series of stories. It points to one man and his name is Jesus. And then on top of that, the Bible itself has one long storyline connected to it. So contrary to popular belief, the Bible is not a collection of ethical principles, moral platitudes, or abstract life lessons. The Bible is one ultimate plan, one ultimate plot, one ultimate champion, one ultimate king. His name is Jesus. Amen. So in all my years preaching, teaching the Bible, these are the two most important things that I think you need to know about your Bible. Number one is that the Bible testifies of Jesus Christ. That's what the Bible testifies of it. Uh, you know... A lot of us think when we read our Bibles, maybe if you're a new believer, you think, man, well, Jesus, the first appearance of Jesus was when he was a little baby in Bethlehem. But no, he's been around since the beginning, before the beginning of time. Jesus has always been around. He's not just that little baby. Sometimes we think that his story starts in the book of Matthew, but that's not the case. The Bible's witness to Jesus doesn't begin just there. It's a common thread that runs from Genesis to Revelation. Did you know that? That we can find Jesus Christ in the book of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Some of you, when you checked in, you got a little card. That little card's yours to take home. That's every book of the Bible where you're gonna find 
Jesus in the Old Testament scriptures. It's been said that if the New Testament is Jesus revealed, the Old Testament is Jesus concealed. There was a guy by the name of B.B. Warfield, a theologian. This is what he says. The Old Testament is like a room full of treasures, but the room is dimly lit. It's filled with prophets that predict him, patterns that preview him, and promises that anticipate him. And if we were to observe the Bible's landscape from 50,000 feet, focused on Jesus, it would look like this. The Old Testament, anticipation. The Gospels, manifestation. The book of Acts, proclamation. The epistles, explanation. Revelation, consummation. (laughs) From beginning to end, your Bible is this epic story that points to and testifies of Jesus Christ. You're gonna read about the one who comes to earth, truly God, truly man, lived a perfect life, died an atoning death, rose to overcome sin, Satan, darkness, and death. Everything Adam failed to be, everything Israel failed to be, everything we have failed to be, Jesus succeeded where we cannot. And the author who designed us to worship and enjoy him and whom we've offended because of our sin and rebellion has stepped into the storyline to redeem it. Now, do you have your Bible with you? I sure hope so. Let's open it to the Gospel of John chapter five. Hey, y'all. I'm not drawing attention to you at all. Why are you walking faster? (laughs) Gospel of John chapter five. This is Jesus talking to a group of Pharisees. And in verse 39, he tells them this. You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. And it is they that bear witness about me. Yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. Skip down to verse 46. For if you believe Moses, you would believe me. For he wrote of me. Did you catch that? But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? So Jesus is telling them, The scripture speaks of me when Moses wrote his books. Let me ask you, Bible scholars, which books did Moses write? The first five. There we go. Some people got an A plus. You hesitant ones get a C today, okay? He says, Moses wrote of me. When he wrote down what he was writing, he wrote of me. Yet, it beats me because I can go back and read Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, and I do not see the name Jesus anywhere. Do you? We don't find that name. But do not be deceived that it is speaking of Jesus. That's what he pointed out to these religious leaders. He said, you're searching the scriptures, but it's not searching for truth. You're only analyzing the minutia of the law. You're only trying to find out these things that you're not doing. He said, you've missed the whole point of scriptures because they testify Of me is what Jesus is saying. And that's why you're not possessing eternal life. You've missed that the scriptures testifies of the only holy one who can offer eternal life, and that's Jesus. So guys, when you open up your Bible, if you fail to see that in the pages of scripture, when you sit down to read it, it is pointing to testifying of Jesus Christ. Don't ever let that lens leave your eyes when you pick up your Holy Bible, that it is testifying of Jesus. Yes, there are a lot of great and awesome stories through the Bible. There are wonderful principles that we follow as we live life. But each and every one of those things point back to, give a shadow of Jesus Christ. And you have to remember that. Because Jesus goes out of his way to point this out. He points it out when he's talking to the Pharisees and the Sadducees. He points out that the chief value of the Bible is that it testifies of him. The entirety of scripture gives witness to the person of Jesus. And I know that's hard for us to wrap our heads around. 
but it makes reading the Bible so awesome when you do. When you look at the, the sacrifices of Leviticus, which I'm sure you do on a daily basis. You read those first seven chapters of the sacrifices and the burnt offerings and you think, man, there is a picture of Jesus. But it is. It is the way that man was to draw close to God through the sacrifice that was made. Not of bulls and goats, no, the lamb of God. So when you look at those sacrifices and you think about what Jesus has done, yes, there's the forgiveness of sin, there's fellowship with God. These are all the things that these sacrifices would do in the Old Testament. In fact, flip over to the book of Hebrews, chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. Let's look at verse four. Hebrews 10 verse four says, for it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Consequently, when Christ came into the world, he said, sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and in sin offerings, you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, behold, I've come to do your will, O God, as it is written of me in the scroll of the book. He says, you see all these offerings and sacrifices that didn't do away with sin. That didn't atone for sin once and for all. He says, but you, you didn't desire that. What you desired was for me to put on flesh. What you desired was for me to become this sacrifice to fulfill your will as it is written of me in the volume of the book. This is the writer of Hebrews pointing back to the fact that this is all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. Now, let me ask you a question. Let's say you, you, you bought a, a rundown house somewhere. You're gonna fix it up. You're gonna make something out of it. In this market, you're gonna make a killing, right? And you start cleaning that thing up and maybe under a floorboard somewhere, you notice there's a box. And you crack that box open and you discover stacks of $1,000 bills, $1,000 bills. And you begin to inspect them and you see this image of Jefferson Davis. You say, wow, look at there. Now an antique dealer may buy them from you, but they're not gonna buy it for thousands of dollars per bill, are they? You see, those bills wouldn't be nearly their original value because Confederate government doesn't exist anymore and those bills were only printed under the Confederate government. So they're not legal tender. You understand what I'm saying here? At one time, the sacrificial system had some weight to it. It had value to it because that's the only thing that mankind had to offer to God, something sinless, paying the price for the sinful. And that's all that they had to offer. And it was part of their livelihood. And they would offer that back to God. And they would say, this is all I have to give. And they would do this. And they would be in right standing for God, but only until the next sin took place, which could be immediate. You understand the blood of bulls and goats never paid the price. It, it never fully atoned for mankind. There was a time and place where it worked, but what it was doing was pointing to the ultimate sacrifice that would come in Jesus Christ. The one whose death would atone fully, completely, wash away sins, past, present, and future. His blood shed would do that. And that's what the Bible, the Old Testament has pointed to since the beginning. God's own word promised to replace the system centered on priests in the temple. Flawed earthly components were symbols of real remedy for sin, which is the one-time sacrifice of Jesus. Now listen to this. I'm gonna read it real fast. The word of God centers its attention on Jesus Christ. 
He is the seed of the woman who will crush the serpent's head. He's the ark to rescue the people of God. He's the seed of Abraham in whom all the families of the earth will be blessed. He's the Passover lamb. He's the prophet greater than Moses. He's the pillar of cloud and fire in the wilderness. He is the rock that was struck by Moses. He's the tabernacle, the temple, and the manna that gives life. He is every sacrifice and every offering in the book of Leviticus. He is the spotless lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He is the rest resurrected lion from the tribe of Judah. He is the ascended Lord, the ruler of the church and the returning judge of all men. He is Jesus. He is our Lord. He is our savior. Amen. Oh, that's, that's what the Bible tells us, points to. You know, I'll give you a challenge. You want some homework? Here's your challenge. Go read the story of the ark. Know in the ark, Genesis 6. See how many ways Jesus fits into that picture. Okay, that's your challenge. I'll, I'll, I'll give you a few. There was only one door that you could enter the ark by. Jesus is the one way by which man can be saved. The Bible says that the Holy Spirit of God seals us in Christ. Do you know that ark was sealed with pitch on the outside? You didn't know it was glued together, did you? The ark had three levels to it. We serve a triune God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. You see, those are just a few to get you started. But when you start reading your Bible and with the lens of Jesus Christ, you start seeing that it really does testify about him. It foreshadows who he is. He's the redeemer. He is the ark that saves humanity from the flood of sin. Well, it wasn't just to the Pharisees and the Sadducees that he said this. He said this to two of his own disciples. Flip over to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24. Luke, chapter 24. Now, this is after the resurrection. Jesus had died on the cross, he had risen from the dead, but not all the disciples knew that. Some of them were making their way back home from Jerusalem. And there were two guys, I forget one of them, I think one of them's named Cleopas. I had a cousin named Clovis. That's another story. Cle- <laughs> Cleopas. But they're walking back home. And Jesus appears to them on the road. Now, they do not recognize him as being Jesus. And he asked them, why are you so sad? And they said, did you just get to Jerusalem today? Didn't you hear the one that we called Messiah has died? And in verse 27 of Luke chapter 24, The Bible says, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Now, can you imagine getting a commentary on what the word of God has to say about Jesus from Jesus? I wonder if he took them through the ark I wonder if he took them through all of those things that that I find so amazing, all these little obscure stories that really picture Christ. Did he take them through there? Did he tell them about Samson that at the end of his life, he puts out his right hand and his left hand, the same shape that Jesus would have been in, and his death brought great victory. I wonder if, if, if he walked them through all of the sacrifices and all of the offerings that the things and the people would do? Did he walk them through the building of the tabernacle and point out, this is him. The curtain, that's his flesh. That's how you enter into the holy place. I can't imagine what that was like. But God's revelation of his redemptive plan began small, a promised seed that would come from the woman with the intent of crushing the head of the serpent. And over time, this revelation unfolds and it becomes clearer and clearer. The promise would come through Abraham, then Isaac, then Jacob, then Judah, then David. 
et cetera, et cetera, Jesus is born. And at the end of the Old Testament, the readers of Jesus' day were looking, hoping, longing for one that's going to deliver Israel. That's what they're looking for. All of Israel was waiting on the one that will fulfill the promise to be the Messiah, the son of David. And these disciples that walked along the Emmaus road with Jesus knew God had promised a Messiah that would redeem Israel. And they were hoping that Jesus was their Messiah, but now they've lost all hope. So how did the Lord Jesus Christ himself renew their hope? He opened the scriptures to them and he began to interpret them, showing him the things concerning himself. Now, these two disciples, their own testimony, okay? Because I would love to tell you Jesus just walked away and and, and that was the story. But no, he sat down to eat with them. And they broke bread and Jesus broke the bread. And when he did, their eyes were opened. They realized who this was and he disappeared from their sight. And the first thing that they had to say, did our hearts not burn when he shared the scriptures with us? You see, the word of God is life, folks. What is gonna bring you hope during times of hopelessness? is to read that testimony of Jesus. What is going to lift you up in down times? What is going to give you hope? What is going to uh, lift your spirit, help your countenance? And, and, And this is not just platitudes that I'm giving you. This is real life application. I go to the word of God. Now, absolutely, there are other things that I do, but I don't do any of those things until I go to the word of God because that's where our hope lies, because our hope is in Jesus and this word testifies of him. So I have to know that when I get this word and it gets embedded in my heart, that I'm being lifted up by the counsel of Christ himself. Wow. Jesus showed these guys that God had been speaking about him from the beginning. And if God had been speaking about him from the beginning, then there's no doubt that this redemption that he's going to bring came through him, even if they didn't understand how or why. There's no plan B in God's book. You know that, right? It's only Jesus. He's always been the plan to redeem to himself those that would trust in Christ as the only means of salvation through repentance and faith. We don't need a new message. There's only one message, right? Jesus Christ. We don't need a new message. We must speak boldly and clearly the message of reconciliation with God through Jesus. That's the message. And no matter if I'm preaching in Genesis or I'm preaching in Revelation, that's the message. In fact, the book of Revelation, the very first lines of the book tell you that this is a revelation of whom? Jesus Christ. We want to make it a revelation of the end times. No, it is a revelation of Jesus Christ. It just pertains to times that are far off. God announced beforehand in type and shadow and promise and prophecy, Jesus is going to come. He did. He did everything that was prophesied that he would do because the Bible testifies of him. Now, point number two. The Bible has a storyline. Starts in a garden, it ends in a garden. Okay? Let me walk you through this really quick. The story begins with God introducing himself. He's the creator and owner of all creation. God then forms Adam's physical frame from the dust of the ground, breathes life into him, makes him a living being. From the first moment of his consciousness, Adam knew that he was looking into the face of God and he knew that he belonged to him. God then created woman from the man so that there may be a union in which they serve God in partnership. 
God showered good gifts on Adam and Eve. He brought them into his beautiful garden that he created for them so that they could flourish. He gave them responsibility to work the garden. Their greatest gift, of course, was the gift of knowing God personally, knowing his presence. He existed in a form which they could see and know. And God walked with them in the garden in the cool of the day. They shared their lives, celebrated their work. They lived in joy. It was a reflection of heaven on earth. This is the garden. But a great disaster happened. The man and the woman felt that they wanted to know of this knowledge called good and evil. They were led to believe by a cunning serpent that this knowledge was something that God was keeping from them. They began to wonder what it would be like to color outside the lines to decide what's right and wrong for themselves, not to need God to tell them. So they made a choice and quickly discovered that this knowledge of evil is never a one-time experience, but a power that gripped them and gripped their children and everyone that would be born after them. And we've lived with that ever since. Adam and Eve found themselves cast out of the garden alienated from God. They no longer saw the face of God. Their children were born into a world that still had the marks of God's love and God's blessing. But at the same time, this world that they love so much that God had created for them is now under the curse of sin. It was a world which they would discover drought, danger, division, and even death. On the very day that sin entered into the world, God promised that it would not stand. He said, I'm going to send someone to deliver mankind. It's someone that's gonna be born of the woman. It's gonna crush the head of the serpent, defeat the purpose of this enemy who introduced this wickedness into the world. And from this point on, the Bible's taking us on this great journey to find this one who is going to do that. The Bible wants us to see that the whole storyline is based upon finding this one who's going to crush the head of the serpent, yet mysteriously, he's going to be struck upon the hill. What do we do? Well, the Bible begins to drop clues as to who this one is. God appears to a man named Abraham and says, I'm going to bless you. And through you, all the nations of the earth are going to be blessed. So we know we're looking for a descendant of Abraham. We know clue number one, that's who we're looking for. Someone that's going to come from this line of Abraham. Abraham has a son named Isaac. Isaac was the father of Esau and Jacob. And of these twins, Jacob was renamed by God, Israel. And he fathered 12 sons, and one of these sons named Joseph was born. He became a leader down in Egypt. And he allowed the 12 other sons in Israel to move there during a time of famine. And after 400 years of this, God's people became slaves to Egypt. And God raised up a man by the name of Moses to deliver them out of Egypt where they had become slaves. And by this time, the names of the sons of Israel were now names of tribes, not just people, groups of people. And Moses was now to lead God's people out of Egypt to the promised land. And he did so successfully, but he himself could not enter. When he couldn't enter, the next man stepped up to lead. His name was Joshua. Joshua led Israel into the promised land and finished the job of taking it. Once that was somewhat accomplished, Israel began to desire a king to lead them. And the Lord gave them what they wanted, a king named Saul. The first king started well, but he ended poorly. Then God said, I'll bring another king in. He anointed a little shepherd boy by the name of David to step up and be the next king. God spoke to David and made a covenant. He says, look, as long as I'm on the throne, one of yours is gonna be on the throne. So now we have clue number two. Not only is this gonna be a son of Abraham, he's also gonna be of the line of David. This is going to be the king of kings. So we have the two clues now. David dies, a civil war breaks out. Israel breaks into two nations, Israel in the north, Judah in the south. And God would relay his message to kings through men who we call prophets. The prophet Isaiah spoke about one who would not only be a king of of royalty, but one who would suffer and die, a servant of all men. 
one who would lay his life down as a sacrifice, take the punishment that would bring us peace. So now we're looking for someone, the descendant of Abraham in the lineage of David, one who would suffer terribly. And when the time came for this one to come into the world, God signified it with a star in the sky. Angels who are usually hidden step out of the glory realm to proclaim the birth of this one that's come into the world. The splendor of the birth of the one who would be the savior. And not only does this one appear as a man, but becomes a man and actually takes on human flesh. Born of a woman, the lineage of David, he's laid in a manger and he's called Emmanuel, which means God with us. He's given the name Jesus because it means he will save his people. He lives this perfect life of obedience to the will of God. He completes, fulfills the work the Father has to give him. He's born as a man in whom evil had no entrance, a man born of the woman over whom the enemy had no hold. Jesus was unlike any other person who had ever lived in the history of the world. He went and gave his life on a cross, laid down his life that was perfect and became the sacrifice for our sins. Jesus entered death itself, Even death had no hold over him because he rose on the third day and he ascended into heaven. Now for the first time since Adam is a man completely, totally in the flesh standing in the full presence of God. That's a big deal. That's a huge deal. You see, when you think about what Jesus has done, He didn't just put on flesh for 33 years and then discard it as soon as he was resurrected. No. He sits at the right hand of God, still in flesh. In fact, the Bible says when you see him, you will see the scars on his body, in his hand and in his side. It wasn't just for a little while that he wanted to become man. This was an eternal decision to put on flesh to identify with me and for you. The love that he had to say, I will lay down all of this splendor and glory and I'm gonna put on flesh because I love these people so much and I see what sin has done for them. So now at the right hand of God, Jesus ever lives to make intercession and he's not doing that as a spirit being. No, he has on glorified flesh and he's sitting at the right hand of God. As you follow follow the Bible story, we see that those who repent and put their trust in Jesus are gathered into the body of Christ, which we call the church. And this body is comprised of people from every nation, tribe, and language, and has experienced many difficulties. And through Christ's people, we know the power of the Spirit. And our struggle is with the world, the flesh, and the devil. Jesus promised he was going to come again. And when he does, he's going to bring his people into his presence. That's the promise, that he will return. He says, I don't want you to to be ignorant as those who have no hope. He says, I want you to know that I'm going to return. I'm going to come back and I'm going to be in the cloud of glory and I'm going to bring you up to where I am, that where I am, you may be also. You see, we call this the rapture of the church. Then at the very end of the Bible story, we're told what has been hinted all along. God is going to create a new heaven and a new earth. And as C.S. Lewis puts it, At present, we're on the outside of the world. We're on the wrong side of the door. You see, when Christ returns, then we're ushered back into his presence. And guess what it looks like? It looks like a garden where everything started. It's a breathtaking sweep of the Bible story what God has done for me and you and what this word of God says to us, the world as we know it, the first man, the first woman. And the Bible ends with God creating this 
paradise that looks a lot like the very first one. Turn over to the book of Revelation real quick, chapter 22. I'm almost done. Revelation chapter 22. This is speaking of a place that comes down out of heaven. It's called the New Jerusalem. It is this place that is described by John in great detail of where believers will spend a lot of time. Revelation chapter 22, verse 2 says, On either side of the river, the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Now, one difference that you see between the old Eden and the new garden, there's no tree of knowledge of good and evil, is it? It just speaks of the tree of life. In the old Eden, there were four rivers that separated everything out. The book of Genesis names them. Here we see on either side of the river, there's one river. This garden is free not only from the presence of evil, but it's free from the possibility of evil. <laughs> and on the old Eden, man and woman were not permitted to eat from the tree of life, but now they have free access and the tree bears 12 different crops of fruit and the variety speaks of the riches of life that is continually replenished in the presence of God time and time again over and over again. Eternity is never going to be dull, y'all. If you think eternity is sitting on a cloud, playing a harp, eating grapes, man, you've missed it. Eternity is going to be full of life, ever-changing variety. The greatest joys of life in this world are nothing more than just neon signs that point to the greatness of God. Think about this. Just think about it for just a second. How long did it take God to create this world? Huh? How long? Six days. And he rested on the seventh, right? That's what we read in Genesis. And this world is pretty awesome, don't you think? If you've ever seen the Grand Canyon or Niagara Falls, or if you've ever seen hill country when the sun's going down, my Lord, that's where the Lord must live, right there. Right? I mean, you see this stuff and you think, my goodness, this is as beautiful as it can be. And this was done in six days. How long has Jesus been preparing a place for those that love him? Over 2,000 years, he's been preparing this place for those that love him, that he is going to bring us to that place that where he is, we may be also, John 14. And so if this world took six days to make and the beauty and the splendor of it is breathtaking and Jesus has been working on the place where we're going for 2,000 years, then this is like living in a trash can compared to what he's doing up there, right? My word. It's just pointer fingers that points to the reality. These are just shadows, this is not the reality. This is some awesome stuff, but all it should be doing is telling us that God is, the reality of this is in Christ Jesus. The reality of this is in glory. It's a better home awaiting us. Now, I'll, I'll be the first to admit I'm not an animal guy. I'm not. I tried to be. It just, it's not part of me. I had two dogs when, when Amber and I first got married and those were two of the dumbest dogs I ever had, ever. And I can remember what made me think these dogs just, they have a screw loose. I would pour their food in a bowl and I'd call them and they'd come running and I would point at the bowl and say, there's your food. Without fail, every single time, both of them would rather sniff my finger than eat the food. It's right there. And if I did that, they're not eating the food, they're sniffing me. I'm like, why? Are, why? 
Why are you doing that? Why, why aren't you? I'm pointing to the reality of what you really want here. But you're caught up with some kind of smell. And I think we do that a lot too. I think we get caught up in the things of this world. And we forget that there is, there is the reality of that beyond uh, on the other side of eternity. That we forget that that's the reality and this is just the shadow. And we want to hold on to this so tightly. But guys, all of this, anything and everything that is temporal, it's going to pass away. We have a better home and it's waiting on the other side of glory for those that believe in Jesus. Amen. Goodness gracious. Look, you're going to savor fruits that Adam even never tasted. It's going to be greatness. There's a better home. There's a better work. Look at Revelation 22 verse 3. No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and the lamb will be in it and his servants will worship him. Look at verse five. The Lord God will be their light and they will reign forever and ever. You see, in the new creation, you're going to serve, you're going to worship, and you're going to reign. That's the job that God has given us in the new Jerusalem. The first calling, right, in the first garden, Adam served by working and keeping the garden. His calling was to exercise dominion over all that God had made. He was to fill the earth and subdue it. He was to be fruitful and multiply. And when the serpent came, Adam did not maintain his rule. You see, so it's the kind of the, the, the same thing that was put on the first man now has been put on believers in the second garden here, so to speak. But now God's people are restored to this position of serving and worship and reigning. And when God speaks about us reigning, he's telling us that life will be ordered and brought under control. Praise God. You ever watch the news and just think this, this world's out of control? It's just out of control. You're no longer going to be subject to the tyranny of time task, conscientious colleagues, or meddling managers. You're no longer going to be swept away by unpredictable tides of emotional impulses, and you're no longer going to be subject to danger or death. Praise God for that. It's going to be wonderful. Better home, better work, better company. Look at verse 12 of Revelation 21. Flip back a chapter. Revelation 21, verse 12. Speaking of the new Jerusalem, it had a great high wall with 12 gates. And at the gates, 12 angels. And on the gates, the names of the 12 tribes of the sons of Israel were inscribed. On the east three gates, on the north three gates, and on the south three gates, and on the west three gates. The old Eden was enjoyed by one man and one woman. But now there's a vast crowd that you have to have 12 different gates to get them all in the city, right? There's people from every tribe, tongue, and nation, every person out of the plane of humanity. And he's brought them into this greater joy that they've never known. 12 entrances, People are coming to this city from every direction, north, south, east, and west. People from China, Russia, Africa, America, every nation is going to be represented in heaven. You do know that, right? Every nation will be represented. An angel stands at each gate in John's vision, and all the gates are open. Now, if you'll remember, at the end of the old garden, an angel was put in front of the gate with a sword to keep people out. Now we have angels at 12 different gates saying, come in. You're welcome. That's amazing. Christ has broken the sword of judgment. He's taken the judgment upon himself, and these angels are just the welcoming party. There's also a better knowledge of the Lord there. Look, at, look up at verse three of chapter 21. 
I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. God's presence in this garden city has got to be the best thing about it. I mean, you know, God making his home with man. And it's so powerful and so awesome that the sun is not even going to be present. You know that the sun, the S-U-N in the sky is not even necessary. Why? Because scripture tells us that he is the light. He is the light. And there's no need for the sun. My word. I don't know how all of that works. I can read John's poetic language. He's limited. I would be limited. You would be limited to describe this in full. But what I do know is what makes this city of God, the city of God is God himself and the lamb who was slain to make it possible. This is the storyline of the Bible. God created man and wanted to be in the presence of man. Man sinned, so God sent his son to pay the price of man so he could bring him back to a garden and live with him in harmony. Wow. It's a big circle, isn't it? You started in a garden, you're going to end in a garden. That's the storyline of the Bible. The dwelling place of God is with man. And that's why God sent Jesus, so that we could be with him. And if you don't know Jesus as Savior, then you don't have a place with God. You see, Jesus is the door. He is the answer. He is the way that a person can be forgiven of their sinfulness to have a seat at the table with God, so to speak, to have a place in the garden city. And so if you don't know Jesus as Savior, then that is my plea for you. And do you know how you come to know Jesus and to be in Christ and to have this place with God? It is by God's grace through faith. You put your faith in Jesus. You repent of your sinfulness. God forgives it. He brings you, brings you into his family. And not just for a little bit, forever. So those are the two things that I hope that you learned in, in any Bible teaching that I ever did, because those are really the only two things that I wanted you to know, is that the Bible testifies of Jesus Christ and that it has a storyline that is full of love and redemption of God towards man. That's it. That's the simplicity of it. And you say, man, you took the long way around the block to tell us that. I know I did. Let's pray. Father God, my heart is just pounding out of my chest. I love these people that you've given me this time with. I love each and every one of them, God, that you've allowed me to share your word with. And as I was thinking about this time, Lord, you know this, that all I wanted to do was give you glory. All I wanted to do was lift up Jesus Christ. And I pray that that was the case. I pray that you would, you was lifted up, God, and that you would draw all men unto yourself. That's, that was your promise, God, and I thank you for that. Lord, as we go from this place, Lord, it is not about any man in the flesh besides Jesus Christ. Lord, there's no story that makes sense without the storyline of Scripture. Help us to remember that, that it's all about your son. It's all about what he's done for us and how you are getting us from one garden to the next. We put our faith in you. We put our trust in you. We put our hope in you. And it's in Jesus' name I pray, amen. Now, guys. I get to see you one more time if you show up Sunday. Pastor Van's gonna let me uh, preach this Sunday, kind of a, 
a goodbye message and I love you. I, I, I'm so glad I got to, to preach and teach God's word with you guys. You, you guys are special to me. I love you all. Thank you. All right. Y'all get out of here. Love you.